grace, mercy, and peace, they're yours. They're yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The portion of God, God's word that we want to focus our attention on this morning is recorded in the second chapter of the first epistle of the Apostle John, the first two verses where we read these words. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This weekend, our brothers and sisters in the faith all, all throughout this country, in our church party, they're celebrating the festival of the Reformation. The Reformation is, is something to celebrate because through that, through that Reformation, through people like Martin Luther and others, God brought to light precious biblical truths that had been hidden or obscured for a long period of time. This morning, on the basis of these words, we're going to focus on one of those truths, and that is the forgiveness of our sins. That's what John really draws our attention to in these words. Martin Luther said of that teaching of the forgiveness of sins that of all the articles, that is the most important and the most comforting. The realization that God had freely and fully forgiven all of his sins for Jesus' sake, nothing meant more to Luther than that. How about you? How about me? The truth of forgiveness of sins is something that many of us here have heard longer than we can remember and more times than we can remember. Virtually every time that, that we've walked into this house of worship, no matter how heavy our hearts are with guilt, no matter what time of the year it is, that message of forgiveness is always there for us. If it's Christmas time, what do we hear? That Jesus Christ appeared to take away sin by the sacrifice of himself. If it's a season of Lent, we're reminded to look at the cross because there Jesus was delivered for our offenses. If it's Easter, we're told he rose for our justification, for the assurance, the guarantee that our sins are forgiven. If it's ascension, we're reminded of what John tells us here, that Jesus ascended to heaven to be our defense attorney, to plead for us by pointing, pointing to his atonement for our sin. Even on Pentecost, we're reminded that the Holy Spirit does his life-saving work in human hearts through the gospel, the message of forgiveness. And every time there's a baptism, every time we have the opportunity to come to the Lord's table and receive communion, we treasure those sacraments because they're tangible ways that God assures us our sins are really forgiven. When we hear about that forgiveness of sins, it's made crystal clear to us that that forgiveness comes unconditional too. No conditions attached to it whatsoever. Never once do we hear, your sins will be forgiven if, or your sins are forgiven but, or your sins are forgiven when. It's always consistently been your sins past, present, and future, are already forgiven by the atoning work of Jesus Christ. No doubt is left in our minds that our sins are forgiven because he, Jesus is exactly what John declares him to be, the atonement, the covering for our sins, the one who by his perfect life and painful death made atonement for every sin we've ever committed. 
I've often thought to myself, how many people in the, the history of the Christian church have been, have heard and understood that message of free and full forgiveness as clearly and as consistently as we have? There's a reason that we stress that message of forgiveness. We stress it again and again because that forgiveness of sins in Jesus is the only answer to sin. And there is nothing more deadly, nothing more dominant, nothing more destructive in our world than sin. I, I know, we, we, we don't tend to talk about sin too much in our world today, do we? Much less to point to it as the source of all of our problems. But no matter how much people might disguise it or defend it or, or brush it aside and belittle it, the fact remains sin is the most destructive thing that any one of us can bring into our lives. To minimize sin, to talk about it as just more, nothing but a mistake or an error in judgment as people are, are so prone to do is tantamount to calling a hurricane a gentle summer breeze. We may not like to talk about sin, but in his word, God mentions it in no less than 689 different passages, and he talks about hell, the consequence of sin, in 53 specific passages. God wants us to know, to know clearly the destructive power of sin. Sin hurts the body. If you don't think so, Talk to people whose lives have been ruined by STDs or alcohol abuse or drug abuse. Sin harms the mind. It reduces mental capacity. It scars the memory. It rivets minds on sensual things and diminishes the capacity to love the good and the beautiful. Sin involves others. It entangles friends and family members and often drags its consequences down to the third and fourth generation. Sin harms the soul. It separates the soul from God and it condemns its unforgiven victims to an eternal separation from God. But you know the worst thing? The worst thing is that you and I are born sinners. If one thing I've learned in 77 years of living is that sin is a constant in my life. No matter how much I don't want it to be, no matter how much I fight against it, try to resist it, the fact remains that sin is so woven into every fiber of my being that I end up having to confess with the Apostle Paul, I know that nothing good lives in me that's in my sinful flesh. For I have the desire to do what's good but I can't carry it out. And what's true of me, I know is true of everybody else here. Every one of us have to say, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful flesh. I have the desire to do what's good, but I cannot carry it out. Brothers and sisters, where would we be? Where would any of us be if we didn't have this beautiful truth that John tells us here. That we sinful human beings have one who passionately pleads for us. Whose pleading is effective because he has given his life as an atonement for our sins. Where would we be if we had to face life and death still believing or thinking that we had to do something for our forgiveness. How horrible it would be to live without the assurance that every thought, every word, every action of our life is covered by the grace of our God. And conversely, what greater joy can anybody have? What greater peace can any message bring than the knowledge that our sins have been forgiven us and removed as far as the east is from the west, that they've been drowned in the depths of the sea, that in Christ they've been forgiven and forgotten. The 
But you know, when you hear a message as clearly and as consistently as we've heard that message of forgiveness, there's a danger, isn't there? A danger to begin to take it for granted. The danger of, of starting to look at the good news like old news, like yesterday's headlines. To almost yawn when once again our worship leader stands in front of us, uh, in front of us as we heard again today, and announces that our sins are forgiven. If you and I no longer have our hearts warmed or excited by that message of forgiveness, then, then we need to pick up this book. We need to let the Holy Spirit, through his word, remind us of our sin and its horrible consequences. And then we need to let him refresh and renew in us the joy in that, that powerful that amazing message of the forgiveness of sins through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. God wants us to cherish that message. Above all, he wants us to, to cherish it because by cherishing that message, we, we learn to cherish Jesus. We learn to remember that without Jesus, we have nothing. But when we've got Jesus and we've got his forgiveness, we've got everything, no matter what else we have or don't have. But another reason to cherish that message is the one that, that John reminds us of here. Did you catch it? Catch it? Let, me, let me read it again. He talks about Jesus and he says he's the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. John brings a powerful reminder that that forgiveness of sins is not a truth we just want to put on a plaque on the wall and admire it for ourselves. It's for the world. When Jesus shed his blood on Calvary's cross, he covered your sins and mine, our sins of the past, our sins of the present, our sins of the future. When Jesus died on Calvary's cross, his blood was shed for the sins of the people who are sitting beside you this morning or in back of you or in front of you. When Jesus shed his blood, he covered the sins of the people out there in our world, the moralists, the atheists, the agnostics, the materialists, the lesbians, the homosexuals, the builders, the busters, the boomers, and every other generation. When Jesus died on Calvary's cross, he was the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the animist in Africa, of the secularist in Australia, of the Islam people in Indonesia, of the Buddhist in Japan, of the Hindu in India, and the nominal Catholic in Latin America. There are 8 billion people in our world today. 8 billion. If we could look every one of them in the eye, God, God granted we would be able to. We would never meet one single individual for whom Jesus didn't shed his blood to atone for their sins. But what good is that message for them? What hope can they have? What peace in life or in death if they don't hear about that message? Years ago, Ernest Hemingway wrote a book called The Capital of the World. In that book, he told a story of, of a father and son who lived in Spain, and the father and son became estranged, so much so that, that the son ran away from home and fled to the city of Madrid. Well, the father loved his son and went after him. He searched all through Madrid day and night trying to find his son but couldn't find him. In desperation, he finally took out an ad in the local newspaper, and the ad read like this. Paco, please meet me at the Montana Hotel Tuesday at noon. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. 
on Tuesday at noon, the father went to the Montana Hotel and was just amazed at what he saw. 800 Pacos were gathered there, all of them looking for a father who loved them and had forgiven them. How many people aren't there in our world just like that? Looking for a heavenly father who loves them and has forgiven them. Maybe they don't know what they're looking for. Maybe they don't realize how much they need that love and that forgiveness, but they do. Every single night throughout our world, there's millions of little children who go to bed not knowing what our children know, that, that they're watched over by a, a good shepherd who loves them and laid down his life for them. Every single day, millions of parents get up and eke out a living and, and in the midst of all kinds of frustrations, try and raise their children without knowing that God loves them so much that he sacrificed his son as an atoning sacrifice for their sins. And if he loved them that much, he certainly loves them enough to take care of them and lead them and support them through life. Every day, Millions of people bury their dead and they're inconsolable, inconsolable. Why? Because they don't know of the, the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means. You and I have that precious heritage from the Reformation, that, that gospel message of free and unconditional forgiveness but it's something God wants us to share with others. And this Reformation weekend, will you please join me in a prayer? We pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the message of forgiveness of sins in Jesus. What a heritage that message is. What a message for us to cherish. It means the difference for each of us between life and death, heaven and hell. Keep each of us as humble people who cherish that message of forgiveness of sins because we know how desperately we need it for ourselves. Who cherish it so intensely that we're ready to defend that message against any mutation or manhandling of it. And Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, make that gospel message of forgiveness burn in our hearts so that we do everything in our power to share it with others. That every time our hearts fill with joy and gratitude because Jesus paid for our sins, those words of John come popping into our minds. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please join me now.